Treatment for chronic pain remains one of those medical mysteries. Each of us deals with it differently. One person's minor ache is another's agony. The main relief comes from a variety of drugs, drugs that are often abused by addicts, drugs that have their own international black market. As a result, in this country, doctors tend to under-prescribe painkillers because of their addictive nature and for fear of attracting the attention of authorities. Their patients are also often under suspicion when they try to alleviate unrelenting pain when they become prisoners of pain. Here with the story of one man's ordeal. At the Tomoka Hills Maximum Security Prison just outside of Daytona Beach, Florida, barbed wire and constant surveillance are meant to keep its hard cases from escaping. But there's at least one inmate who poses no such threat. Hi, Mr. Pay. Hi, Mr. Pay. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Richard Pay is in a wheelchair because of a severe spinal injury. Without constant medication, he is in excruciating pain. It was pain that put him on the path to prison. I felt like my legs were being dipped into a, 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 a furnace. Uh, they, were, they were burning and I, I couldn't move them. It's an intense pain that uh, over time will uh, literally drive you to suicide. Which it did at one point. Yes, it did, twice. And for me, death would have been a form of relief. Painkilling drugs were his salvation. Painkilling drugs put him behind bars for drug trafficking. Drug trafficking sounds like sounds the horrible. The business it's, of that's selling right. drugs. So how did this Ivy League educated lawyer and 47-year-old father of three end up as a convicted drug trafficker? It began in 1985 when he saw a promising future shattered in a car crash outside Philadelphia. A failed operation left him with metal screws in his spine and unrelenting pain. To add to his problems, he was later diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Pay says doctors could do little for him beyond prescribing painkillers. Percocet, Vicodin, acetaminophen with codeine. The drugs worked, but only briefly. As I got worse, I developed uh, uh, a tolerance also with the medication, and so I needed larger doses, higher doses. To relieve the pain? Yes, to relieve the pain, to, to be a father, to be a husband, to be a uh, member of the community. I mean, the choice was to lie in, almost lie in bed and be a vegetable. Pay's wife, Linda, worried about his growing dependence on the drugs. We were fearful of addiction. We were always worried. He was afraid to take too many pills. He, he, he would play these mental games to, to try to decrease them himself. Without the drugs, there was no relief? No. No, there wasn't. But when the Pays moved to Florida, getting the drugs was the problem. Pay says doctors were fearful of attracting police attention because of his high doses. One was quite frank and said that I was um, in a in, in a word, he said screwed, and uh, uh, I was in that uh, medical nightmare zone where you've gone through all the treatments and nothing works, and what does work, what does help, uh, no one wants to prescribe because it attracts attention and no one wants that attention. So what did you do for medication? My doctor in New Jersey, who had been with me for almost seven years, agreed to continue care. Pay's doctor in New Jersey, Stephen Nurkowitz, agreed to mail and fax prescriptions to him in Florida. To ensure that Richard would never run out of pills, his worst nightmare, Nurkowitz left some of the prescriptions undated. But Pay's frequent refills drew the attention of law enforcement. Florida's seen a dramatic increase in the sale of black market painkillers. Convinced that Pay might have been reselling the drugs, local police placed him under surveillance. After two months, they made their bust. They had guns and ski masks and like five, six people ran into the house and half of them took the, the kids and my mother-in-law and the other one grabbed me and Rich kept on saying, please call my doctor, Can, call my doctor. You know, everything's, everything's fine, call my doctor. And uh, they said they already have. Indeed they had. The doctor was originally a suspect. In interviews with the DEA, Dr. Nurkowitz at first supported Pay and admitted mailing him undated prescriptions. And when pharmacists called, he verified the prescriptions. 
But when he was later shown evidence that Pei had filled 200 prescriptions over a two-year period for 18,000 pills, he then stated that all of the prescriptions were forgeries, including some he'd originally verified to pharmacists. He was no longer a suspect. He became a witness for the prosecution. Dr. Nurkowitz would not talk to us. State prosecutor Scott Andringa would. And while he acknowledged that Nurkowitz's statements were inconsistent and contradictory, he also says Richard Pay took advantage of his doctor's inattention to detail. In Richard Pay's room, all over his room, there were the raw materials to make prescriptions. He found a lot of documents that suggested forging prescriptions, uh, copying prescriptions, uh, in order to create new blank prescriptions. In addition to the blank prescriptions, Andringa says police also found a copy machine, a doctor's stamp, and Dr. Nurkowitz's DEA number written in Pay's address book. It's a crime to forge prescriptions, which is what he did, and it's a crime to use a forged prescription that you stole in order to get drugs from a, a pharmacy, which is what he did. Despite the evidence, Pay continues to deny any wrongdoing. On the accusation of selling, he says, he never sold any drugs. They put my wife and I, my family, under surveillance for three months. During that three-month period, they followed us to church. They followed my wife to work. They interviewed my neighbors. This went on for three months. They found nothing. Apparently, they, they found 60 bottles of pills in your home. They found 60 empty bottles. Did you ever sell any pills? Never. No. Mr. Safer, I, I was in such pain. They were so hard to get. Um, I was a buyer in a sense. I mean, I wasn't a seller. But Andringa says Pay couldn't possibly have taken all the pills he obtained, an amount that would require him to consume 25 pills a day. One pill every hour, every day, for two years. Without, assuming he didn't sleep, if he slept for any period of time during that two-year period, he'd have to take more. Did you assume at the beginning that he was selling drugs? There was certainly an implication that he was selling drugs. You did not present a shred of evidence that he sold a single pill. Nobody saw him selling. The evidence suggests it, but it doesn't prove it conclusively. But it is a reasonable inference from the facts that he was selling them because no person can consume all these pills. But Pay says he consumed every single pill. We asked Dr. Russell Portnoy, chairman of the Department of Pain Medicine at New York's Beth Israel Hospital, if that's possible. People are, are literally able to take industrial strength doses without sustaining any problem at all. Look, I take care of two grandmothers, each one requiring grams a day of morphine. Absolutely extraordinary doses. Now, obviously, if these high doses were given, before they had a chance to acclimate to the drug, they would have been lethal. Are the authorities overzealous in, in going after doctors and patients who are abusing pain medication? Well, there's a very deep concern on the part of the medical profession that the authorities don't know anything about pain medicine and are so afraid of prescription drug abuse that they tend to investigate or go after prescribers on the basis of very weak evidence. I see far more patients committing prescription fraud and getting caught doing it than I see doctors getting arrested for over-prescribing over drugs. In the end, while there was no evidence Pay was selling drugs, under Florida law, the possession of just one bottle of illegally obtained painkillers, just 28 grams, is considered drug trafficking which carries a higher penalty than trafficking in much larger amounts of cocaine. The word trafficking in a lot of people's minds outside the law uh, suggests sale. Trafficking can mean sale, but it can also mean possession of a quantity of a controlled substance over a certain amount. And Pei easily obtained that amount. Surveillance video shows Pei walking with difficulty with the aid of leg braces. It also shows him obtaining 1,600 pills over a 41-day period with eight prescriptions that his doctor said were forged. Pay was facing serious charges. And Dringa's office offered him a plea bargain, which carried no jail time as long as he admitted to the crimes. But Pay says he feared that 
would be trading one prison for another. There is something worse than living in severe, unrelenting pain, and that's living in severe, unrelenting pain, not getting relief. Had I accepted a, a, a plea bargain and uh, carried that uh, a conviction on my record, I it would have found it near impossible to get any medication. I didn't want to plead guilty to something that I, I didn't do. Stubborn? You stubborn guy? I thought it was a principled position to take. I, I was uh, trying to retake that dignity. I, I had lost, and, I, and this, I felt the state was so hell-bent on taking from me. But Andringa says that the jury was convinced by the evidence that Pei had forged some prescriptions. This case is not about pain patients. It's just not. This case is about prescription fraud. We were very reasonable in this case. But once somebody says, I'm not going to accept a plea offer, however reasonable it is, then... You throw the book. Exactly. And Mr. Payne knew that. He went to law school. A jury convicted Richard Pay of 15 counts of prescription forgery, unlawful possession of a controlled substance, and drug trafficking. Under Florida law, the judge had no alternative but to sentence him to 25 years. Did you expect that to happen? <sighs> no, we expected to win, sir. Linda Pay was shattered by the verdict. She says it's just too difficult for her to allow her children to see their father in prison. I'm not going to tell the children that they're, he's going to be in for 25 years. I just, I can't do that. Um, you know, I really, I really think he will get out. And as time goes, you know, they grow, he gets grayer. So I, I'm the only one who sees that. What do your uh, appeal lawyers say the chances are? They have um, high hopes that, that he'll be released. Um, but, you know, I didn't think he'd be convicted. Dr. Portnoy, among the most eminent pain specialists in the country, says that Pay's behavior, wanting to ensure a steady stream of painkillers, is not unusual among patients in severe pain. It really sounds like, like um, society used a, a mallet to try to handle a problem that required a much more subtle approach. If they had taken this man who had engaged in behaviors that were unacceptable and treated it as a medical issue, it seems like this patient would have had better pain control and a functional life instead of being in prison. For 25 years in prison. Yeah, for 25 years. It's mind-boggling. Ironically, Richard Pay now gets all the drugs he needs. The state of Florida pays for a morphine pump, which delivers a constant stream of medication directly to his spine, providing him with pain relief at doses more powerful than the drugs he was taking when he was arrested.